Yakuza, an action game series known for its unique style, engaging story, and addicting distractions. Yakuza as a series would rise to popularity and critical acclaim over the years, but its origins are somewhat unassuming. It introduced gaming to the world of the Yakuza, a new environment and theme that hadn't been touched upon before, and used it to deliver some incredibly enthralling and emotional storytelling. I'd like to start at the beginning and take a look back at how the series kicked off. We'll be taking a look at the roots of Yakuza, going in depth on every single game and all of its aspects. Today, I'll be looking at the first game in the series, talking about gameplay, mechanics, story, and everything in between. If you like the video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe as it really helps out the channel. You can also support me over on Patreon where I upload extended cuts of my videos with content that YouTube won't let me upload as well as monthly update videos. Spoiler alert for Yakuza. Hey dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Yakuza. Hey dad, have I told you about Gamersups yet? Dear! Gamersups is an energy formula built by and for gamers. Hola! It is keto friendly and has zero calories, so it's a fantastic way to boost your performance while you're gaming away at your computer. My favorite upside is that it has organic caffeine, and when a guy like me drinks too much caffeine, I get the jitters and panic attacks. And the organic caffeine doesn't do that. They also have caffeine free varieties if you want to go no caff at all. They also have sweet shaker bottles like this, or their waifu cups, their waifu shirts, and even some creator cups. Now with my code, HEYDAD, you can get 10% off your order at Gamersubs. If you're watching this video on release, for the next six hours, you can get free samples with free shipping. That's zero dollars to try Gamersubs for free. All jokes aside, it's actually a genuinely good product, and if you make a purchase over there with my code, it helps the channel out and supports everything that I'm doing. So follow the link in the description, save 10% on your order, or in the first six hours, claim some of those free samples with free shipping to try Gamersups for free. Bye, Dad. The first game in the Yakuza series started out being called Project J. The idea came from Sega veteran Toshihiro Nagoshi, who worked on massive games like Virtua Fighter, Daytona USA, Shenmue, and was responsible for the Super Monkey Ball series. Nagoshi didn't want to compete with the American gaming market at the time because of the huge budgets of companies like Rockstar, EA, and Activision. He wanted to double down on the Japanese gaming market and target the adult Japanese male. The higher-ups didn't expect Nagoshi to pitch something like Yakuza, though, and the game was rejected. Nagoshi persevered, though, and at the time, Sega and Sammy had just merged. He forced the demo of the game into a preview meeting, and Hajime Satomi, the new owner and CEO, liked what he saw. The budget of the game was 2.4 billion yen, around 21 million US dollars, and was built on an entirely new engine. Most of the team working on Yakuza, known in Japan as Ryuga Gotoku, did not have experience in this genre. They had come from games like Virtua Fighter 3, Super Monkey Ball, Panzer Dragoon, and Jet Set Radio. Nagoshi felt this set them apart, though, as they were all on a level playing field. The setting in the game, Kamurocho, was based on the red light district of the real-life city, Kabukacho, Tokyo. The team strived for accuracy with the game's representations of, well, everything. They tried to recreate the city, they researched hostess clubs, and wanted to make sure that the Yakuza themselves were portrayed accurately. The game's writing was split into two, main plot and subplots. The main plot was mostly written by novelist Hase Saishu, known for Yakuza crime novels like Sleepless Town. Yakuza was heavily pushed and localized in the West. Sega funded ad campaigns and even invested into an English voice cast of mostly cult voice actors like Michael Madsen and Mark Hamill. 
The game was in part funded through in-game marketing. Boss coffee ads and vending machines, Don Quixote, Suntory, and even Sega themselves. Yakuza, or Ryu Ga Gotoku, was eventually released on December 8, 2005 in Japan and September 5, 2006 in North America for the PlayStation 2. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few things. The first is the version of this game that I'll be playing. In January of 2016, Sega released a complete remake of Yakuza, entitled Yakuza Kiwami. It was a total overhaul of the graphical systems and most of the combat systems. It just 100% looks better and most of the time plays better. I decided to use footage from Kiwami for this review, as it's just more pleasing to look at. Kiwami also adds some cutscenes and story information that fleshes out the characters better, tying it into later entries in the series. It also adds more side content and ends up just fitting better in the series in the long run. Where necessary, I'll be going over the differences in the versions of the game, as I did play both for this video. The big difference that I want to get out of the way at the beginning is the English dub, released in the West for Yakuza. It's become kind of a meme online because of how bad it was and was really just a reflection of English dubs at the time it was created. Stupid! Fucking! Motherfucker! Don't give me that bullshit! I just want to talk to Kazuki. Shut the fuck up! People do just fine! Without any help from the fucking Yakuza. You fucking Yakuza! Don't fuck with Kazuki-san! It's also got some pretty poor translation issues that affect the way the story overall is portrayed. The second thing is the structure of this video. In each of the series that I tackle, I usually try to develop a video structure that is unique to that series. One of Yakuza's greatest strengths, and something that makes it stand out from other games, is its distractions. There are so many things that can be done around Kamurocho, and tons of things to get lost in. Throughout my review, I'll be focusing on the main story and the gameplay mechanics that we encounter along the way, weaving the two together as I normally do. Once we reach the end of the story, I'll go back and talk about all of the distractions that each game has, the fun little things that we can get lost in throughout the city. The third thing I want to address is the question you're probably asking yourself right now. Why Yakuza? Yakuza has an enthralling, engaging, hilarious, gut-wrenching, and at times incredibly wholesome story. Its characters are well-developed, its combat is fun, its world is one you can get lost in, and it has an unexplainable aura of style and charm that is unmatched throughout video games overall. It's also had an incredible effect on me over the years, and got me through a lot of rough times, which we'll obviously talk about as we go through each game. Yakuza means a lot to me, and I want you to know why it means a lot to me, and why it's so fantastic in the first place. There's also the fact that I just spent the last two months talking about dark Doomer games and playing a series that I consider doomed to fail in the modern day, so I figured I'd take it in the other direction. Even though Yakuza can definitely tug at the heartstrings, it's a lot more upbeat, it's got its fun, shining moments, and it's actually still getting very good entries to this day. I would argue some of the best in the entire series. The final thing I want to talk about before we get into the game is pronunciation. I have very little experience with actually speaking Japanese. I know how to say the basic phrases, and that's exactly where it ends. I know some of you are going to criticize my pronunciation of names and words, but I just want you to know I'm going to try my best to get things right while recording and editing this video. There's going to be a lot of Japanese names and words. I'm sure I'm not going to get every single one of them right, but I'm trying here, Dad. Yakuza starts with a date, October 1st, 1995. We see our main character, Kazuma Kiryu, standing over a dead body, a gun in his hand, and a ring on the ground. The police arrive, the thunder and the rain in the background. From there, we jump back to the previous day, 
Kiryu is riding in the car with Shinji. Shinji is dragging Kiryu to a collection. If the title didn't make it obvious, the two are in the Yakuza, a Japanese crime organization that is kind of their equivalent to the North American Mafia. A very early form of a social classification which may have served as the foundations of the Yakuza originated all the way back during the Edo period of Japan. The organization reached its peak in the 1960s and has been dwindling ever since. One thing I want to get clear before we get into things is the structure of the Yakuza in the games. This can be pretty confusing for first timers and it's a bit better to have it laid out before we start than to figure it out along the way. Most cities in Yakuza are ruled by one entity. In the case of Kamurocho, that's the Tojo clan. Each clan has their own chairman, which is ultimately the head of the clan that everyone answers to. Below the chairman are the patriarchs of the higher tier families in the Tojo clan. Below that are the second tier families with their patriarchs answering above. Even below that are the captains of each family, the lieutenants, and the general members. Captains will often even have their own families. For example, Shintaro Kazuma is the captain of the Dojima family, but has his own Kazuma family. It can get a bit more complicated than that, but for now, we'll just keep it at the basics. Our main character, Kiryu, is the lieutenant advisor of the Dojima family when we start the game. Kiryu and Shinji head to Peace Finance to collect some money that the loan sharks owe. The man asks for one more day, but the Yakuza don't accept that. When under duress and fearing for his life, Hirata decides to face the two head on. We beat them down and the two take the money that Hirata owed. With the money in tow, it seems like Kiryu might have a chance at starting his own Yakuza family. On the way to deliver the money, Kiryu runs into another Yakuza who gets mouthy, and after their fight, another Yakuza steps in. This is Majima, a very large character in our story overall. Captain of the Shimano family and patriarch of his own family. <laughs> The Yakuza Kiryu fought has had fear stricken in his heart just by the name of the legendary Dragon of Dojima. Majima beats some fear into the man as well, but we see the juxtaposition of the way the two dole out orders. Majima wants to fight Kiryu, but he refuses, even after receiving multiple blows. This setup is perfect for the story moving forward, and this end bit was actually added for Kiwami. It sets up Kiryu as the man he is though, someone staunch in his beliefs and opinions, someone who won't back down, but someone who is also in control. There's no fear in those eyes, no rage, no hatred, just determination. Even as Majimo jabs his blade toward Kiryu's face, he still stands strong. Was he willing to die here for his principles, or did he just know that Majima would not have killed him? Kiryu is a fantastic character, probably one of the best video game characters of all time, if I'm being honest. And don't worry, we'll get into that very heavily over the course of this series. Majima is also a fantastic character, and after this encounter, he's determined to fight Kiryu. <laughs> He's going to force Kiryu to fight him, and he's excited about it. Majima is kind of a chaotic dude. He's all about wreaking havoc, but he's not devoid of morals either. Kiryu heads to Sedena, his local watering hole, to get some drinks and meet up with his best friend Nishiki. Kiryu asks Reina, the bartender, where Yumi is, and Nishiki is congratulating Kiryu on his new assumed Yakuza achievements. Kiryu isn't so sure, and he asks about Nishiki's sister. She's sick and in the hospital, and we learn this surgery might be her last. Yumi shows up and has some drinks with the three of them, Kiryu focusing on her ring. We jump back to a few months ago and Yumi and Reina are entertaining a bar guest when Nishiki and Kiryu show up. 
They're talking about a casino venture that Kiryu might take on, but he doesn't believe in it fully. Nishiki is dreaming that Kiryu could have his own family, but Kiryu thinks that lieutenant might be enough for him, a respectable job. Here we see the difference between the two friends, the stark divide in these two men. One satisfied with what he has, ready to do things in the right way, and only really wanting leadership when it's thrust upon him. The other ready for more, yearning for power and heights far above his own head. Reina reminds the two to get Yumi a birthday present because the big day is coming up soon. Nishiki already got her a necklace, but Kiryu still has to find something for her. Kiryu wants to take a rain check on the party because he hasn't gotten her anything, but Reina suggests he go and get her a ring right now. Kiryu leaves to get a ring based on Reina's recommendation, and we get our first real quest. We head to La Marche, running through the still not fully open streets of Kamarocho. Usually for the first few chapters of each game, we can't exactly just go wherever we want. It's a little linear, and a few hours into the story, we're given free reign. This does well to slowly introduce us to all of the mechanics and things that we can do, because Yakuza has a lot of things to do. Kiryu gets the ring from La Marche, Yumi's name engraved on the inside. A pickpocket steals it from him as he leaves and we chase him through the streets, eventually fighting him. He doesn't have the ring though and already pawned it, blowing all of his money on lottery tickets. Kiryu heads to Ibisu Pawn, but they don't believe the ring is his and he wants him to buy it outright. He sees Shinji on the streets and asks if he'll lend him some money, and Shinji thinks it must be for a soap land, a Japanese bathhouse slash brothel. When Kiryu heads back to the pawn shop with the 120,000 yen, the price has changed because it's in high demand. Kiryu borrows more money from Shinji, but when Kiryu gets back, the pawn shop owner realized the ring was his due to the engraving and decides to give it to him for free. The four have their birthday celebration at Sedena, and Kiryu is nervous to give Yumi her ring, setting up his feelings for her early on. Yumi is happy with the ring, and Reina remembers that Yumi didn't want the ring from another man, so she must feel very strong towards Kiryu. This scene also sets up a budding relationship between Reina and Nishiki. We jump back to October 1st, and Nishiki is gone, off to seemingly get some glory, jealous of Kiryu's success. Kiryu has to deliver the money that he got from Peace Finance, and on the way, he talks to two informants. Tamada and Aoki, who will be important later. Arriving at the HQ, Kiryu gives Kazuma the money, Kashiwagi in on the conversation as well. Kashiwagi is directly beneath Kazuma, a captain of the Kazuma family. Kazuma gives some wisdom to Kiryu and Kashiwagi lets it slip that Kazuma used to be a Tojo clan assassin. <laughs> As Kazuma reminisces on Kiryu's life, we get some insight into their relationship. They seem to be close as Kazuma doesn't want Kiryu to be formal with him. Kazuma tells Kiryu he should visit the orphanage that Nishiki, Yumi, and him grew up in called Sunflower. There was actually a live-action prelude film made for the original game that gives us a lot of insight into the characters before these events. It shows us the relationship that the three had and how they bonded at the Sunflower Orphanage. As the two are talking, Kiryu gets a phone call from Shinji. Yumi has been kidnapped by Sohai Dojima, the patriarch of the Dojima family that Kiryu is in. Nishiki took off after Dojima, and Kazuma tries to get Kiryu to not get involved until he can do something, but Kiryu says he can't leave his family behind. Kiryu gets stopped by the Peace Finance guys on the way and dispenses with them. He shows up too late, and Nishiki has done something bad, a gun in his hand and the Patriarch on the ground in front of him. <laughs> The cops are about to show up, and seeing the situation, Kiryu knows he has to take the blame. He tells Nishiki to get out and take care of his sister. 
The cops show up and Kiryu finds Yumi's ring on the ground before he's taken to jail. The investigator, Makoto Date, doesn't believe that Kiryu was the one who killed Dojima, but the police force wants this case closed as soon as possible. Kiryu asks that Date give Yumi's ring to Kazuma and tell him he's sorry. Shinji visits Kiryu to tell him that he's been expelled from the Tojo clan, but not completely banished. He still has a chance of being reinstated after he's released. We also learn that Yumi doesn't remember anything, and that she escaped from the hospital. In prison, Kiryu is attacked by some other prisoners, and he learns that the chairman of the Tojo clan gave the order. Some Dojima family members are wondering what Kazuma and Nishiki are going to do now that Kiryu is gone, and Nishiki overhears them. Reina slightly blames Nishiki for the things that have happened, and it bubbles up into rage as he smacks her. This event thus far has been destructive to the entire family, and this shows that its effects are far outside of just Kiryu. Ten years have passed and Kiryu gets his parole, but just before he's let out, he gets his first piece of mail, a letter from Kazuma. The patriarchs and captains are all being invited to the Tojo HQ for a meeting, summoned by Nishiki himself, who is now patriarch of his own family. The clan's funds of 10 billion yen, or 76 million United States dollars, were stolen from their holding place of Tautau Bank. Shimano, one of the upper rank patriarchs, is enraged at this news, as Sarah ends the meeting. We get to hear the contents of Kazuma's letter. He wants Kiryu to meet the owner of a club, Stardust, named Kazuki, but doesn't say much else. Now that ten years has passed, much has changed in Kamurocho. Perhaps the worst time to be locked in prison for ten years would be during the time of 1995 to 2005. I can assume it would be incredibly jarring to come back home to a world so advanced and changed, and we see this in Kiryu's character throughout the story and sub-stories. Before we get into things, I'd like to talk about the battle system. We haven't been in too many fights yet as we're still getting used to things, but the combat mechanics this game presents are pretty robust. First and foremost, Yakuza is a brawler, but the upgrade system it presents has been expanded upon a lot in the remake. Through Kiryu, we have a variety of different attacks that get built upon throughout the game. Our basic attacks are square, which when pressed repeatedly will deliver a combo. Pressing triangle during any of these will deliver a finishing blow to end the combo. We can fill a heat bar throughout combat by completing a variety of actions, blocking, hitting, or dodging. This will allow us to complete heat actions, which are special, particularly brutal attacks that do quite a bit of damage. We can unlock a lot more of these through the upgrade system. Kiryu can also sidestep and evade attacks. The circle button will allow us to grab enemies, punching them, or throwing them from there. Outside of this, Kiryu has four different fighting stances that he can use. Brawler, the medium basic stance, is a mid-road between damage and mobility. We can effectively evade while also dealing a good amount of damage. The B stance is much less mobile, but has wide swinging attacks that can hit multiple enemies and can do a lot of damage. The rush stance is in the other direction, focusing on mobility over damage. It's much quicker, delivering many more lighter punches and focusing on one target rather than multiple. We also can't grab when in this stance, so there are pros and cons to each. The final stance is the Dragon of Dojima. Up until this point, that stance has been fully upgraded and very powerful, the fighting stance that gave Kiryu his name and legend status in the first place. Now, after 10 years have passed, that stance has weakened, and we have to relearn those abilities. Majima tells us this much when we see him on the street. This is the introduction to another system, the Majima Everywhere mode. This sees us fighting Majima all over town, him trying to sneak up on us when we least expect it, and get Kiryu to get his power back by basically training with him, but also wanting to have a challenging opponent at the same time. Every time we fight Majima, we'll unlock new abilities for the Dragon Stance, upgrading it over time. We have to level up Majima's rank, and getting the bar maxed out will start a special event where we fight Majima in a different outfit or face him during a minigame. 
it's okay, but feels very grindy towards the end, and there are so many ranks that I ended up having to fight Majima like 50 times to get all of the dragon style abilities unlocked. All of this was an addition that Kiwami made. The original PS2 version of the game had some basic upgrade trees that you could unlock with experience over time, seeing Kiryu grow as the game progressed. Kiwami takes that idea and expands upon it in every way, taking most of its systems from the game released previously, Yakuza 0. We can also upgrade the dragon style by training with a man named Komaki and completing different sub-stories with him. We also have the ability to equip weapons and gear, strengthening our attacks and defense. We can even get stones that bring us back to life after taking lethal damage. The whole combat system is pretty fantastic and works incredibly well, especially the stances. Every time I found myself getting frustrated with an encounter, I realized I needed to switch out of my comfort zone and use another stance. The game wasn't designed to be played through with your favorite stance. Each encounter has an easier way to progress through it. Each stance counters a type of enemy. You have to read enemies properly and realize what would be a good foil for them to fight against. There are some exceptions to this rule and some fights that really frustrated me, but we'll get to those in time. If there's anything bad that I have to say about the combat system, it's how the dragon stance progresses. It takes quite a while for this stance to even get good, because some of the Majima Everywhere system is locked behind story content. So most of the time, unless you're rushing through the story, the dragon stance doesn't get usable until the end of the game. The other stances aren't as bad with this, but they're also still pretty locked at the beginning of the game, making combat not feel very versatile. I think this is primarily because of the game basing its upgrade system off of Yakuza 0, which worked better there as you were using money to upgrade your abilities, not experience. Overall though, the system feels good, and rushing through a building full of enemies with beast style and mowing down fields of Yakuza always feels satisfying. Kiryu decides to look for an informant in the city, the Tamada that he met before, to try and get acclimated to the way things are now. He can't find Tamada, but Aoki tells him that he's dead. He followed Kiryu's case too close and got killed. Aoki has taken up his trade now and says that Reina still works at Serena and Stardust is right across the street from it, a popular host club on Tenkaichi Street. Aoki also tells us that someone was murdered nearby, a high-level executive of the Tojo clan, but he isn't sure who. Kiryu heads to Stardust looking for Kazuki, but someone stops him outside of the club, not wanting Yakuza in the club. He's clearly against Yakuza and doesn't want them to have any part in his business because he doesn't want to bow to them. Kiryu dispenses with him easily and Kazuki finally shows himself. He was told of Kiryu's arrival by Kazuma and Yuya apologizes for earlier once he realizes who Kiryu is. Kazuki tells him that Kazuma supported him when he started the host club, and he's helped him ever since. He also reveals that the murder was none other than the third chairman of the Tojo clan, Seda himself. Some patrons start causing trouble downstairs, and Kiryu and the boys handle it. One of the goons recognizes who Kiryu is, saying that he works for Shimano, and tries to shoot Kiryu, but Shinji arrives just in time. We learn from Kazuki that Nishiki betrayed the Kazuma family, working with the Omi Alliance, another clan on the level of the Tojo clan. Shinji is in the Nishiki family and says he isn't the man that Kiryu once knew. The chairman's funeral is tomorrow and Kiryu thinks he can get some time to talk to Kazuma there. Kazuki, we flash back to 1996, a year after Kiryu went to prison. Nishiki is getting his own family, and the Kazuma family is giving him some of their best men, all Kazuma's idea. Kashiwagi says the Kazuma family can't take Kiryu when he gets out, but Nishiki will have to take him in. 
Throughout the game, we'll see these scenes, showing how Nishiki descended and turned into the man that he is today, and it's a wonderful addition. To see this juxtaposition of this happy, hopeful Yakuza member climbing his way up the ranks into a betrayer, plotting and scheming for power. Watching these two forms of a person meet in the middle provides a ton of insight into the character himself. It's fantastic. Shimano is getting his head shaven and getting news that Kiryu is back. He gets nicked and clearly everyone is terrified of him. Kiryu shows up at the funeral and we have to get inside. We can't get noticed inside, avoiding enemies' lines of sight. Inside, we have to help out an attendant to find his entrance card and use it to try and get in, but we have to go the back way. An Omi Alliance member stops us and says that Nishiki hired him to capture Kiryu, showing that Nishiki has gone fully off the deep end, working with another clan entirely. Shinji helps Kiryu get inside and meet Kazuma. Kazuma says he wanted to help Kiryu, but he couldn't while he was in prison, and he understands. After Kiryu went to prison, Nishiki made climbing the ranks of the Yakuza his sole ambition, embracing his demons to get there. Kazuma has something to say about Yumi, but he's shot by an assassin before he can get it out. Shimano walks in at this time and thinks that Kiryu was trying to kill the Patriarch. Kiryu fights Shimano's men and dives out the window, beating his way through the leagues of men inside the Tojo HQ. We fight Majima, but he says he doesn't really want to stop Kiryu, it was just orders and that he'll see him later. At the exit, we have to fight Shimano himself, an absolute bulk of a man, huge tattooed torso, bald head. He's a pretty difficult fight, as his punches are hard, doing a lot of damage, and he grabs a lot, which slows everything down, and we're still pretty weak. Yakuza as a whole isn't exactly punishing with its difficulty level, but it doesn't pull its punches either. It's not hard once you get used to the system, and getting the right upgrades to fit your playstyle definitely makes things easier. But when you're starting out, there's a lot of moments where you're fighting against the system, and you have to work hard to figure out what you're doing wrong. Luckily, we have a ton of health drinks that we can use to defeat Shimano. Before Kiryu escapes, we flash back to Nishiki getting his family going. The men that Kazuma sent aren't listening to him, and don't really seem to care about the pecking order, openly disputing him. Matsuhige even states that he would listen to Kiryu as he didn't suck up to the boss all the time. Kiryu is cornered as he leaves, and Date, the investigator on his case before, rolls up in a car to save him. A young girl is watching the news coverage of Kiryu's battle at the chairman's funeral. Date and Kiryu are back in Kamurocho at a bar called Bacchus. Date says he saved Kiryu because he got demoted after pushing too hard on Kiryu's case and his wife and child left him. He's investigating the murder of the chairman and he wants Kiryu to help him. Date gives Kiryu a cell phone, saying even kids have them now. He wants Kiryu to look into Yumi because he believes the money and the murder and the girl are all connected. Kiryu heads to Sedena and reunites with Reina, filling her in on the situation. She says she doesn't know what happened to Yumi after she disappeared from the hospital. She only knows that Yumi's sister, Mizuki, showed up five years ago. Yumi was separated from her family and Mizuki decided to follow in her sister's footsteps, wanting a job at Sedena. She worked there for four years and then opened her own bar called Eris, but Reina doesn't know where it is and hasn't talked to Mizuki since. Reina says she looked just like Yumi, but she had a tattoo on her shoulder. Before Kiryu leaves, she tells us there's a bar at the base of the Millennium Tower, a building constructed five years ago. The bar is called Bacchus, the one we literally just left. Back at Bacchus, Kiryu walks in on a bloodbath. Multiple people have been shot, and the little girl we saw earlier is holding a gun. She was looking for her mom, and when she came in, everyone was dead. We follow Haruka, and she finds a stray puppy being abused by some thugs. We take them down, and Haruka sends us to get some stuff for the puppy. Food, water, and a dish to drink from. Haruka says she lived in an orphanage, and that she's been getting letters from her mother. We carry Haruka to Sedena as she has a fever, and she reveals that she was at Sunflower Orphanage, the same one that our main three cast came from. We also find out that Haruka's mother is Mizuki, Yumi's sister. Haruka wants to help us look for her mother, and while heading through the city, we're stopped by a police officer and have to pretend to be her father. 
Haruka tells Kiryu that Yumi brought her letters from Mizuki every month. The two head to the Millennium Tower, and when a security code is required, Haruka provides it as Mizuki wrote it in one of her letters. Arriving at Eres, we see a picture of Mizuki, and Haruka shows us an amulet that her mother gave her. At this point, some men arrive from the Omi Alliance, the lieutenant advisor with them, Hiroshi Hayashi, and they're after Haruka. Date calls and says that Yumi was the one who stole the 10 billion yen. Her ring was at the scene of the crime. We have a short fight with Hayashi, and Haruka is wondering why people are coming after her. We see a flashback again to Nishiki in the hospital, a doctor telling him that his sister needs a heart transplant, but she doesn't have a donor yet. The doctor tells Nishiki about an organ broker, someone who can get him a heart, but probably not in the most ethical of ways, and it's incredibly expensive. But Nishiki is desperate. He wants to save his sister, and he'll do anything at this point. He heads back to his family headquarters and begs Matsuhige for the money for his sister's operation. <laughs> Matsuhige steps on Nishiki's head, using this opportunity to exert power over his boss and take the upper hand. Back at Serena, Date and Kiryu are discussing the situation as it stands, and the bar gets a call from Shinji. He's on the run with Kazuma, who is still alive but unconscious. Kiryu heads out to search for leads, and Date sends him to a legendary information broker called the Florist of Sai, based out of West Park. West Park is also referred to as Purgatory. It's a safe haven for the homeless, but it's pretty dangerous. Kiryu heads there and gets access through some Purgatory men. In the train station, he finds an underground burgeoning with business and activities, and comes face to face with the florist. We see how the florist gets his information, his network of informants and cameras. He hates Yakuza, but he's willing to work with Kiryu as long as he can do a job for him. He tells Kiryu to enter the underground coliseum and win a tournament. He can use the money to buy the florist's information and get closer to tracking down Yumi and Mizuki. After becoming the new champion of the underground, the florist tells Kiryu that he thinks Nishiki killed the third chairman and is gunning for the now vacant seat. The florist says a woman showed up hiding her face asking for Haruka. The florist gets a call and the two descend into his inner sanctum, cameras around every part of the city. Date is at Purgatory, seemingly shot, and rolling back the florist's footage, we can see he was attacked in the street, and Haruka was taken. Kiryu saves Date from some men, and the florist informs him that the men took Haruka to the batting cages. Date reveals some pretty interesting information, that the florist is an ex-police officer and was let go for leaking police intel after Date blew the whistle on him. Majima was the one to steal Haruka and meets Kiryu at the batting cages. We have to face him in battle and he can be a little tough. At this point in the game his attacks are pretty damaging and kind of hard to counter or avoid. Eventually we cut through his chaotic style and Majima vows to take Kiryu down again. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. His family pulls him out of the batting cages with the blade in his stomach, and Haruka runs out of the back room, reuniting with Kiryu. The person who saved Haruka asked her about the pendant she had, and we flash back to her getting it from Yumi. The man told her that it was worth 10 billion yen. I suppose now is a good time to talk about the music of Yakuza. The first game in the series, the Kiwami version in particular, has some absolute bangers. This series as a whole has probably some of my favorite OST songs of all time. The battle theme, Funk Goes On, is just so groovy and feels like it was pulled straight out of an early Tekken entry. Mm -hmm. 
The PS2 version of the song has its pros too. It's a little more stripped back and you can feel the grain in some of the sounds. The Kiwami version is a lot more polished and jazzed up, but they're both great. Bakami Tai is in this game, but that one was only introduced in Yakuza 5 and was just included here for the fans. Vertical Point, the intro song, has some gritty synths that rip through quickly, backed by some punching bass that slowly builds. This is in contrast to the original version of the song, which is much more slowed down and tame. The music overall is fantastic, and I can't say enough good things about it. It fits the game in every way possible, combining it with the combat, cutscenes, aesthetic, and style creates an atmosphere like no other. Hidenori Shoji does a fantastic job, and has been the composer for every Yakuza and Yakuza-adjacent entry ever. We flash back to Nishiki in the past. Matsuhige is trying to get money for Nishiki, but he's running collections on another Yakuza's turf, which puts him in a bad position with Kashiwagi. He decides to look past it after giving Nishiki a thorough scalding. Kiryu heads to the florist who is keeping an eye on his son. He's with a girl that's the daughter of a wealthy patriarch, and Kiryu decides to help the man out. On the way, he runs into Tamura, who is not dead, but faked his death with the help of the florist to become a better informant. When Kiryu finds the florist's son, he decides to fight him, of course, because everyone wants to fight Kiryu. Why wouldn't they? The Atobe family is chasing the young couple, they're trying to run away with someone else's money. Some thugs show up and try to put a beat down on Takashi, but we put a stop to it. When we find Kiyoka at the club, we realize the dynamic here. Kiyoka's father doesn't approve of Takashi, and the two are in love, ready to give it all up. Kiryu steps in and defeats Asai for the couple, but Takashi doesn't want to leave. This part of the game was really odd. It's incredibly out of place, only realizing why it's weaving into the story during the later half, but it packs some of the most emotional punch in the entire game. <laughs> いいよ、高志、もう行こう。お嬢。親父もそれが不憫でならねえと。高志。俺。あ。俺。確かに今は半端です。でも目いっぱい働きます。頑張って。頑張って。絶対に教科さんを幸せにしますから。口先だけか。証明します。<laughs> Takashi's drive and dedication to prove himself to Asai is admirable, and seeing him go as far to cut his pinky off, not even being in the Yakuza, just for love, is incredible. The letter that Asai reads is gut-wrenching, seeing her father's tears stream down his face as he watches it read by his henchmen, two fathers bonding over children they didn't raise. It's such an odd detour, but it just works. Kiryu heads back to Serena, and Date is passed out drunk. He was supposed to meet up with his daughter at the park, but he missed it. Kiryu takes another detour from the main story and meets Date's child. She seems to be turning tricks in the park, and Kiryu tries to stop her. Saya runs off, and her friend says that she's involved with a sketchy guy. Date and Kiryu find Saya and Shota at Stardust, and the two deal with the thugs she's with. 
We find out Saya borrowed money from the club to pay off her boyfriend's loan shark, and they're both in deep. Kitty you tracks down the guys that took Date and get the debt erased. This is our first big insight into Date himself. Not only is he a good person that seems to want to ultimately get to the truth, but he's also a father. He recognizes that he wasn't there for his child or wife, but he wants to make things right, and he wants what's best for them. I'm sure we can all relate to wanting what's best for people who have wronged us, right Dad? Back at the police station, the force is telling him to step back from the case he's on. A man from Division 1 named Sudo wants to take the case because of their interest in Kiryu. We flash back again to Nishiki in the past, being confronted by Shimano. Shimano belittles Nishiki and tries to turn him against Kazama. Date shows Kiryu a picture back at Serena of a corpse with the same tattoo as Mizuki. Kiryu recognizes the tattoo artist that did the work, the same one that did the dragon tattoo on his own back, so he decides to head there. He says the tattoo isn't his, as he remembers every single one that he's inked, but there are many that imitate his style. Nishiki calls Kiryu at the tattoo parlor, and the two former brothers finally get to talk. He asks him to meet up at Serena the next day, and the tattoo artist offers to touch up his back. We get some reference for the meaning of Kiryu's tattoo and how it relates to Nishiki's own tattoo, the Koi and the Dragon, setting up Nishiki as a powerful rival to Kiryu. Haruka becomes defiant against Kiryu, wanting to be let in on the situation and also really just wanting to see her mother. Haruka runs away and some men capture her in Stardust. They want the pendant and we get this epic scene of Date grabbing Haruka while the pendant is flying through the air and Haruka is wounded. Kiryu realizes the men aren't Yakuza and almost gets their origins out of one of the members but he's shot before he can give the name. Kiryu apologizes to Haruka for not being able to save her mother, finally telling her that she's died. Miraculously, Haruka isn't mad at him. She's understanding. Date takes Haruka to the florist to keep her safe, and he investigates the murder scene of Chairman Sarah. Sudo seems jealous of Date, but he doesn't understand what he's doing. Kiryu heads to a secret gambling parlor behind the lottery ticket stand with Haruka. She tries to help with some dice betting, and he realizes the dice are rigged. Kiryu takes care of the dealers, and he heads back to Purgatory to prepare for his meeting with Nishiki. At Serena, Nishiki enters the bar, and the two former friends meet face to face for the first time in 10 years. The scene is kind of beautiful because it mirrors the one at the beginning of the game. It's delivering the same message, the juxtaposition of these two characters, except Nishiki's personality traits are a lot less subtle now. <laughs> He's shown his true self, who he really is on the inside. Nishiki admits to killing Mizuki, and we see a flashback to him realizing she had died. Nishiki has been searching for Yumi as well all this time, and he wants Haruka and the pendant to get the 10 billion yen. Nishiki has Yumi's ring and knows what we already know, that she was most likely the culprit. He also realizes that he betrayed Kiryu, but that he's too far gone to turn back now. <laughs> お前、俺のことを憎んでいるのか。わからねえ。だが、結局俺はお前を裏切った。風間の親父もな。もう後戻りはできねえ。まさか。風間の親さんを撃ったのは。なあ。さすがにあの時手が震えた。Shinji has a bug on him, courtesy of Nishiki himself, and he won't let anyone stand in his way to get to the top of the Tojo clan. The scene is so well done because it fully forces this rivalry into our faces. Nishiki has been in the background the entire game. We haven't really gotten to see what he's truly like, only talked about in conversation. 
Finally, it's at the forefront. We know who he's become, and he doesn't even consider Kiryu to be his brother anymore. A gut punch to say, and a gut punch to deliver. Outside, Nishiki orders his men to attack Kiryu, and he takes down swarms of them. Outside of challenging boss fights, some of the best moments in the series are mowing down crowds of enemies. It's always so satisfying and just shows the sheer difference in power between Kiryu, the dragon of Dojima, and the lowly members of the Yakuza. We've seen Nishiki again in the past. Matsuhige has brought in some collections from a doctor, totaling 30 million yen. And Nishiki realizes it to be the same doctor that suggested the organ broker for his sister. When he gets to his office, he realizes that he's gone, run off after paying his debts. <laughs> the scene is incredibly powerful, and its placement is just perfect. Right after we see the man that Nishiki has become, the present day, we see what he was in the past, emotion still left inside of him, breaking down outside of the hospital, scared, tired, and fearful for the life of his sister. Now he's a husk of a man, only the thriving for power left inside. Kiryu gets back to purgatory and it's on flames. Haruka has been taken by the gangs that do the work for the Yakuza. Kiryu makes his way through each of the gangs and tracks her to the Snake Flower Triad. Before that happens, we get to do battle with the first of what will be many infuriating boss battles in Yakuza Kiwami, the two Akai brothers. Most of the bosses we've fought so far I haven't really touched too much upon because they can be pretty generic. They're mostly dealt with in the same way and require a little bit of strategy or stance switching, evasion or blocking to finish them. But these two are where the game starts to take a turn. One brother is a little faster and will spin around doing a ton of damage and constantly interrupting your attacks. The other is a little slower, dealing a lot of damage with larger attacks. The two of them together is incredibly frustrating to navigate, because if you're not getting grabbed and bashed by one brother, you're getting downed with kicks by the other. Eventually, Kiryu defeats them and gets the name Lao Ka Long, which unlocks a memory from 12 years ago. Kiryu was kidnapped by Lao, who is the head of the Snake Flower Triad. He was tortured by the Triad and eventually escaped with the help of Kazuma. We see Shimano and Lao speaking about Haruka, the patriarch seemingly hiring the triad to take Haruka. Tarada from the Omi Alliance is also in on the money scheme, getting a cut of the 10 billion yen. In a really important scene, Kiryu ponders if what he did was right, letting Nishiki off the hook and taking the blame for Dojima's death. <laughs> In the end, he decides to put his life on the line for Haruka. Date and Kiryu arrive at the Triad HQ, and Kiryu heads in alone. He's assaulted as soon as we get in the door and we have to make our way through the headquarters. I love these raid-style chapters where we're rushing through the building, constantly assailed by enemies. They are the bread and butter of Yakuza's story and will always be present in some form or another. They make the big chapters just feel so much more grandiose, like we're actually one man against a building of people ready to use knives, bats, and chairs to defeat us, but somehow we come out on top. 
Kiryu arrives at Lao's office and Haruka is tied up on a chair. Lao is pretty cryptic about what he actually wants with Haruka and we eventually have to fight him. This fight wasn't so bad, we avoid Lao's crazy sword attacks and get in our punches where we can. Eventually he goes down and Haruka is rescued, but not before Sudo shows up to arrest Kiryu for kidnapping. Kiryu is being held in jail and Date helps him escape. The badge Date found earlier led back to an underground government organization called the MIA. He found some connections to a man named Jingu, directly involved with the Japanese government. He also reveals that the body they found earlier wasn't Mizuki. Haruka's mother is alive. We have quite a strange sequence as men and cars begin assailing the three. We have to aim and shoot our gun at passing by enemies and try not to let them damage us. I think every Yakuza game has a certain point where it just goes off the rails a bit during the last third of the game, and when it does, you're kind of just along for the ride. The story is so good and its atmosphere and charm are already so out there that the reaction is always just a static kind of, okay, that makes sense. When I first played this sequence, I was kind of stunned because I'd been playing for about 20 hours at this point and I really wasn't ready for an on-the-rails shooting section. But this just really drives the point home that I want to make, and it's that the Yakuza games have everything. There are so many things to do in each game, and Yakuza is the antithesis of feeling bored. You'll never be wanting for more to do because Yakuza has it all, even shooting men on motorbikes down the highway. It also just fits the high stakes action that we've reached at this point in the story and I'm all for it. We flash back to see Nishiki holding a knife to his stomach when Matsuhige walks in. He wants to take some investment funds from the family and finally the disrespect gets to Nishiki. <laughs> He stabs Matsuhige in the stomach fully cementing his downfall into the man that he is today. Shinji tells Kiryu that someone is leaking information to Nishiki, and they head to the florist to find out who. Pretty quickly, we find out that it's Reina, and the florist recognizes her as the woman looking for Haruka before. At Serena, Reina left a letter telling Kiryu everything. She was in love with Nishiki and was giving him information to try and garner his affection. Shinji calls and tells Kiryu that Reina tried to shoot Nishiki and the two are on the run now. Kiryu heads after them and we have another sequence of raiding through enemies in an abandoned cabaret club. On the roof, we have one of the most annoying boss fights in the game, Arase, a sergeant of the Nishiki family. He wields two handguns and will shoot us if we even get close. The only way to do any damage to him after the halfway point of the battle is to get in close and only hit once or twice before moving out of the way. I got lucky and took a lot of his health down in the early stages of the battle, but Yakuza Kiwami has another really annoying mechanic that lets bosses regain health by charging up. You can counter this by using a climax heat action and stopping their charge up, as well as doing a ton of damage to them, but if you don't have any heat gauge then you're screwed. It's just really rough and the long range of this opponent makes things pretty difficult overall. Reina was shot before the battle began, and so was Shinji, but he's still breathing. Before he dies, he gives Kiryu Yumi's ring. Shinji said that Kazama was with a woman named Akemi, and the florist tells him of a place called Shangri-La, a soap land that holds a woman named Akemi. We need a pass to get into Shangri-La, and have to do a favor for a hostess to get one. She's an illegal immigrant and wants to get forged documents so she doesn't get deported and leave her brother behind. After a lot of fuss, we get the woman to make a fake passport for the hostess, and she's already given it away. We then have to find an obsessed fan of hers and pay him 300,000 yen minimum, if you're smart, and he'll give us the Shangri-La card. Before we can head there, Majima traps us into coming to the docks to get into another battle with some former Dojima members. Majima is shot in the ordeal and falls into the water. 
Haruka and Kiryu head to Shangri-La and finally find Akemi. She realizes Shinji is gone and reflects on her time with him. Someone came and took Kazuma away, someone that Shinji trusted. Kazuma is on a boat at the wharf. Akemi also tells us that Nishiki is not only searching for the 10 billion yen, but the deceased chairman's will, which named the fourth chairman of the Tojo clan. If you can't tell, that's a pretty big deal, and I'm pretty sure you can figure out why Nishiki would want that. At this moment, Majima crashes a truck into Shangri-La, his men invading the place. At the bottom of the building, he's holding a woman at knife point. She says she doesn't want to be with him, and he lets her go. Majima is probably at his most chaotic in this game, striking fear into the hearts of everyone surrounding him. I want to note that by chaotic, I mean genuinely fearfully chaotic, not joke Mimi chaotic. Majima decides to face Kiryu again, once and for all, a final battle. He's not too difficult to go up against, and he's honestly one of the least annoying boss rush battles of this entry. We crash through the floor and battle in the kitchen, using pieces of rubble to bash Majima down, and he's thankful for the fight in the end. Tarada is hiding Kazuma at the docks, and Kiryu decides to head for them. We learn that Tarada was the one who saved Haruka at the batting cages, so the Omi Alliance has some stake in this game. He tells Kiryu that he's helping Kazuma because he owes him a debt that he can never repay. Finally, the two are reunited, and Kazuma decides to tell us the whole truth. Now, Kazuma, I'm going to tell you all about it for this year. Okay? Yes. My daughter and Mizuki are not the daughter of the woman. What? The woman is... Mizuki was just an alternative identity that Yumi had been using this whole time. Yumi is actually Haruka's mother, and her father is Jingu, the MIA man that Date has been tracking. Kazuma tried to help Yumi regain her memory after the murder, and through that, Kazuma learned that Nishiki really killed Dojima. Jingu left Yumi to marry the Prime Minister's daughter. Kazuma took care of Yumi and Haruka, but Jingu murdered a journalist who had caught wind of a scandal. Sarah helped him cover it up, and helped him cover up his indiscretions in politics. He hired a hitman to take care of Yumi and Haruka, but Kazuma didn't let that happen. Sarah and Kazuma worked together to change Yumi's look and hire a forger to develop a new identity. The money that Yumi stole was Jingu's 10 billion. It was never the Tojo clans. After this info dump, the boat begins to be assaulted by Shimano's men, and we get to fight the big man himself again. One of my big problems with the boss fights in Yakuza Kiwami is the amount of grunts they include in the fight. Don't get me wrong, I love swiping down hordes of lesser Yakuza in a battle, it's fun and rewarding, but there are certain battles that are just meant to be one-on-one. -on -one. This fight between Kiryu and Shimano should be a one-on-one -on -one battle, I think. There shouldn't be 20 other guys attacking us. They even gave us that luxury with the Lao fight, but they don't give it here. It just seems like we have to deal with these guys first and then take on the boss, and it feels like a hurdle rather than an extra element. Before Shimano dies, he throws a grenade at Kazuma. Tarada can't shoot him fast enough, and Kazama protects Haruka from the blast. Kazuma gives us one last piece of information before he dies. Jingu was using the Tojo clan to launder money, and Kazuma took the money to out Jingu, Yumi wanting to be a part of the plan. Kazuma wants to apologize to Kiryu and tells him that he killed his real parents during his days as an assassin. Sunflower Orphanage was created for the children of the parents he killed. <laughs> ひまわりは俺が親殺した子供のための施設いいんだいいんだ親さん本当の本当の this scene. Kiryu finally recognizes Kazuma as his true father, the man that had raised him, that had given him the life he knew, that had developed everything in his life that he recognized to be true. 
He was dying in his arms, and he didn't even get the chance to tell him fully that he was his real father. It's heartbreaking. It's gut-wrenching. It pulls at the strings of your soul. I don't cry very often at video games, but Dad, this scene made me shed some real tears. Kiryu and Haruka are heading off to Eris, at the top of the Millennium Tower, when a mob attacks them. We have to defend off against waves of thugs before reaching the huge building. Sudo finds Date researching some deep information about Jingu and Sera. Inside the Millennium Tower, we have to fight MIA agents, which are really annoying because they use a lot of guns and grabs. Sudo decides to come to Date's side, supporting him in his investigation. Kiryu and Haruka finally reunite with Yumi after all this time, the girl finally getting to meet her mother. Haruka is happy she gets to see her mother, and the three are together looking distinctly like a family for a moment. Jingu shows up in his helicopter confronting the group. He shoots at Haruka, and Kiryu jumps in front of the bullet. Tarada says he doesn't care about Haruka, that she was just baggage. Tarada shows up to turn the tides, but the Omi Alliance is against him, allying with Jingu himself. Jingu has been orchestrating everything from the beginning, changing alliances, vying for political power, and even manipulating Nishiki so that he could get what he wanted. In a surprise, Yumi pulls out a briefcase with a bomb inside, meaning Jingu can't shoot her or he'll die too. Yumi and Haruka get out, and Kiryu shows Jingu that the third chairman was ahead all along. We learn what was in his will, that no one was named as the fourth chairman. He wanted Kazuma to select a chairman. Kiryu decides to name himself as the Tojo clan's fourth chairman to protect what Kazuma and Sera were fighting for. Jingu flies off and we fight through waves of MIA soldiers, who are all much more adept at combat than the previous Yakuza members and thugs we fought before. We eventually reach the helipad and face Jingu himself, which is easily the most annoying fight in the game. Jingu keeps a big distance, using his handgun to separate us from him, but it isn't even him that's the most obnoxious, it's his guards. They circle us and chase, doing a lot of damage and keeping us subdued. The only problem is that they have a pretty large health bar, and Jingu is shooting at us the entire time. Finally getting them down is a breath of fresh air, as now we can focus on the boss himself. But no, for some reason, they come back to life and get full health bars again, and we have to do the whole thing over. When we finally deal with Jingu, it's not too bad if you know what you're doing. Keeping him in close and dealing as much damage as possible without letting him get a breath is the best possible course of action. When he goes down, Kiryu heads back to Eres and finds Yumi and Haruka. It's not over yet though, because Nishiki is back for a reunion of sorts. He still wants the 10 billion and says he knew Jingu was betraying him from the start. He reveals that he loved Yumi the entire time, but she always wanted Kiryu. Kiryu tries to reason with him, telling him they can't go back in time and change the past, but Nishiki is dead set on settling their rivalry. We get the first sign of a Yakuza staple, the ripping of shirts, revealing the tattoos underneath. This is symbolic, the build-up hinted before that the Koi and the Dragon would go against each other, only one coming out on top, and here we are, truly seeing it for the final time. These two brothers are ready to bear all of themselves for what they truly are. Everything is skin deep now, no suits and costumes, just the Koi against the Dragon. Our final battle of the game is my favorite one, it's so well done. Nishiki has a ton of health, but he isn't particularly hard to defeat. As we decrease his health, the battle isn't afraid to stop and show us scenes from these two's relationship before, back to the start, and now at the end. It's a beautiful, poetic, glorious finale to the game, the thing we've been building to this entire time. Eventually, Nishiki goes down, and Kiryu grabs the pendant. Yumi unlocks it, and Kiryu's picture is inside. She loved him the entire time. When she couldn't remember anything, she still remembered how she felt with him, and she waited for him. She gave it to Haruka because she wanted her to have what was dearest to her. Yumi apologizes to Haruka and says she has something that she needs to do. 
She puts the pendant on a scanner and it opens a door, revealing the 10 billion yen stacked in a room. She plants the bomb on the money and as she's walking away, Jingu shoots Kiryu in the leg and hits Yumi next, the woman standing in front of the bullet to save her daughter. Nishiki stabs Jingu as his last act, saving Kiryu and Haruka. He shoots the bomb and blows up the Millennium Tower, leaving money raining down on the streets of Kamurocho. Kiryu is with Yumi as she breathes her last breaths. He finally gets to confess how he feels about her. He gives her the ring and she tells him she got the tattoo to remember him. She tells Haruka not to run from the things that scare her and the police show up. Sudo and Date quickly pull the police off and Date tells him to come with him. Kiryu seems to have lost all hope, but Date snaps him back out, as Haruka is still the last one alive that he has to protect. Sometime later, Kiryu is running away from the Tojo HQ, some Yakuza begging for the chairman to stay. Kiryu has already secured his succession and retirement, the chairman for only one day. He chose Tarada as the next in line, hoping to do right by Kazuma and Sera. Date decides to stay with his daughter and be a better father in the future. Kiryu finds Haruka in Kamurocho and the story seems to have a happy ending. Kiryu, now Uncle Kaz, walks away with Haruka to lead a hopefully happy life together. Kiryu has lost everything throughout the story of this entry. His best friend turned against him and became a person he could hardly recognize, and then he died. He was finally reunited with the woman he loved after giving up everything to find her, and then she died. His true father, the one that raised him and brought him up in the world, died in his arms. Even his friend Shinji, who helped him every step of the way, died. Kiryu has nothing at the end of all of this, but he finds hope and peace in Haruka. Kiryu is the embodiment of realizing that there's always something to keep you going. I'll be honest, Dad. When I first played Yakuza Kiwami, it was after years of being told to by my friends. I hadn't ventured into that well yet because I knew it was pretty deep, and I wasn't sure if I was ready for all that. But a few years ago, I went through a pretty rough breakup. I went from being constantly busy, going to events, doing things, and just generally having a purpose, to just wanting to stay on the couch and be by myself. I binged a lot of the Yakuza games sitting on my couch after this breakup because I really had nothing else to do. What I wasn't really ready for was this heartwarming story to inspire me, to set me back on track and make me realize that there was always a reason to keep going. I know it's kind of stupid to admit that a video game had to do this for me, Dad, but it was important. And it doesn't really matter how these messages get delivered to us, it just matters that they get there. Over the next few years, it always seemed like Yakuza was there when I needed it. I didn't play every game all at once, but sparsed them out over time, starting a new entry whenever I felt like it was the right time. And we'll get into all of those eventually. After we beat the game on normal difficulty, we can unlock Legend difficulty. We also get access to Platinum Adventure, which allows us to free roam around the game after we've beaten it, and complete sub-stories, play mini-games, and explore every corner of Kamurocho. With that being said, it's probably about time to get into Yakuza's distractions. Don't get me wrong, I love Yakuza's story. It's fantastic, and I've made that point pretty clear thus far. But some of the best parts of any Yakuza game are hidden behind side content, and there's quite a lot of it. Overall, I think Yakuza Kiwami has some of my least favorite side content of the entire series, mostly because it's based on the origins of the series, and a lot of the sub-stories and mini-games are pulled straight from the original PS2 game, when the team was just getting started out. It's still pretty stellar, though, and would be just the beginning for the RGG team branching out and making some really fun and interesting content. In every Yakuza game, there are usually tons of small mini-games, and then two larger mini-games that have longer stories attached to them. Not every game follows this formula, but it's accurate for the most part. A lot of the mini-games that we'll be talking about have been added for Kiwami, because the side content has been very fleshed out for the remake. The first of these two larger mini-games is called Pocket Circuit. This is an on-track racing game where people modify cars to run on tracks and get first place. The actual game is pretty simple. We don't control acceleration that's determined by our car's components. We can use the boost button once or twice per match, depending on the track we're on. But boost can be finicky. It will propel us forward, increasing our speed excessively. 
The only problem is going over a hill or around a tight turn can send the car careening off the track and cause us to lose the whole thing. We can mash the circle button to keep the car on track, but this depletes the energy bar, which doesn't fill back up very fast. It's a risk-reward system, and I mostly found it more useful to just build my car perfectly so that it beat the other racers without using a boost. We can modify our car's gears, motor, tires, frame, stabilizer, bumper, and even decals and body can be switched out. Pocket Circuit Fighter, one of the best racers and the current commentator for events, will allow us to enter into multiple tournaments, and winning certain ones will unlock new parts in the shop. But there's a bigger story here. Kiryu already knows Pocket Circuit Fighter from his time in Yakuza 0. Don't worry, we'll get there eventually. Fighter wants Kiryu to find him a successor as he's getting engaged. Kiryu has to seek out the three children that used to race with him in Zero and see if anyone is willing to become a successor. The kids are now adults that have jobs, but they still have the same dynamic that Kiryu remembers, an odd little love triangle. The real target, though, is Takuma, who is the most worthy successor to Fighter, who is now a host at Stardust. Kiryu eventually beats him and convinces him to get back into pocket circuit racing and become the new commentator, and the three kids are joined together again. This minigame alone took up a few hours of my time, searching for the right build and parts to win all of the races and, and eventually beat Takuma. Things like this are so fun that you don't even realize what you're doing until you're a couple hours into it. It's a fantastic and well-designed little minigame with just the right amount of strategy and style to be engaging. The second large minigame of Kiwami is Mesuking. When Kiryu is traveling the streets of Kamurocho, he finds a trading card on the ground of a woman scantily clad in a bumblebee suit. A child in a lab coat runs up and asks him if he's seen his card, and Kiryu gives it to him. Through this, he introduces us to the game that he's using the cards for, Mesuking. It's a very simple trading card game that ultimately boils down to rock, paper, scissors. It's actually based on a Sega-developed game called Mushi King, the King of Beetles. We choose one of the three options, and if we beat the opponent's choice, we use a skill card attached to that move. This will determine the skill we use and how much damage we do. It can get pretty in-depth with the amount of insect girls we can choose and the breadth of skill options, but it eventually just comes down to rock, paper, scissors. The story attached to Mesa King sees us battling the different kids that play the game at Club Sega. Each of our opponents have something different to learn from Kiryu, and eventually we learn that some kids over at the Club Sega on Theater Avenue are being less than sportsmanlike to the Mesa King players here. We then learn that the professor used to be a bully at the other Club Sega too, but he eventually learned that winning wasn't everything. After beating him, everyone is friends again and playing Mesa King peacefully. The whole story is pretty funny and interesting. The central idea is that these kids are playing this quote-unquote wholesome card game that features scantily clad women wrestling dressed up as bugs. Also the idea that there are arcade feuds and the little mini kid gangs around Mesking is just outlandish in a very specific Yakuza way. The game itself isn't the greatest, as it's pretty simple, and once the opponents stop having patterns to their movements, it's mostly reliant on RNG. Even though these are the larger mini-games, there are tons of smaller ones that we can take part in, just to pass the time or take a load off during story breaks. The batting center, bowling, darts, mahjong, pool, shoji, and UFO catchers are just some of the recreational activities that Kamurocho has to offer. These smaller ones are in almost every Yakuza entry and don't change too much, so I'm not going to go too in-depth into them. Some of them appear inside of sub-stories, where we'll have to bowl someone or beat them in pool. The worst ones for me are Mahjong and Shoji, because I, as an American boy, have never encountered these games in any serious capacity, and the rules are pretty complex if you've never played it before. I remember trying to get platinum trophies in some of the Yakuza games and sitting on my couch at midnight watching videos on the rules of Mahjong just so I could finish out my completion list. There are also a host of gambling games in the casino and around the city. Baccarat, Blackjack, CeeLo, Chohan, Koi Koi, and more. One of my favorite mini games that I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about is karaoke. In every entry, we can travel to a karaoke bar and take part in a Japanese pastime. This little rhythm game will see Kiryu bobbing and singing to the music and is the origin of one of the most popular Yakuza memes of all time. 
It's a tradition for me at this point, when starting a new Yakuza game, to stop in at the karaoke room and play a couple songs, as each entry features different ones and some of the music videos we get for the songs are amazing. If you still want to battle after the main story is completed, you can head back to the Underground Coliseum and take part in a variety of different tournaments being held down there. They can get pretty challenging and even have different modifiers that will do things like make the ground flaming so if you fall down you take damage. You can even use your points from winning at the Coliseum shop to buy different items. The amount of money and experience you get also isn't too shabby. Locker keys are another Yakuza staple that seems to return in just about every entry. Around the city we'll find glowing dots on the street that can be picked up. These are locker keys that we can use to unlock different lockers nearby the Millennium Tower. Inside will be all variety of different weapons, items, and gear. There are a variety of restaurants in Kamurocho, and a lot of the completion list is devoted to ordering everything on the menu. I had a lot more fun with this in other entries, particularly Kiwami 2, but it can be pretty fun in this entry too. Eating food at restaurants fills your health, and getting a full bar from an order won't let you order any more food, unless you get the associated perk. You also get experience from doing this, so trying one of everything across the city can be time-consuming, but also worth it. Speaking of the completion list, for every item checked off, you get some amount of completion points, or CP. These can be turned into Bob Utsunomiya for perks like upgrading stamina or running speed. The last type of distraction that we have to touch upon are the sub-stories, arguably the largest portion of the side content in any Yakuza game. Substories are basically side quests, short little stories or adventures that we encounter when roaming around the city. We already talked about a couple that were connected to Mesa King and Pocket Circuit. I'm not going to talk about every single substory, as that would be an unmanageable length for this video, but I would like to talk about some of my favorites in this entry. One that stood out to me was the badass dad competition in Purgatory. A journalist is doing a story on bad boys in the park and stops Kiryu because she thinks he looks like one. When asking him questions, Date and the florist show up and the three start a competition to see who the best bad dad is. We can win or lose this competition based on our answers and we'll get a different reward for each. The whole thing is just really absurd, and the dialogue between the three men is pretty funny. They bounce off of each other well, and they're all pretty aloof to the whole thing. In Pursuit of Pleasure starts when Kiryu sees a couple fighting in the street. There's a misunderstanding, and a man steps in to break things up, and turns out to be the famous judoka Shinohara. He's retired, and Kiryu shows him a good time around the city, taking him to restaurants, a cabaret club, and eventually the Colosseum. This makes Shinohara realize he wants to keep fighting, and we unlock him as an opponent in the underground fighting ring. The Yakuza's Apprentice is a pretty interesting one that sees a man named Kano fighting Kiryu. He wants to be Kiryu's minion and runs around town trying to get Yakuza jobs for him. He eventually gets into trouble and tries to have Kiryu killed by hitmen. He decides to get out of the Yakuza business and leaves. It's not bad and has some silly humor in it, this man that desperately wants to be a Yakuza but is just so bad at it. It's also kind of long, taking place across four different substories. Most of the Yakuza substories are pretty bland though, mostly because, like I said before, a lot of them are pulled straight from the original game, and some of them are just thieves scamming people and us fighting them. This obviously changes drastically over the next few entries, and we get some really standout stories in this small side content. Yakuza always has a ton of stuff to do, and this entry is no exception. You can spend hours just running around town trying to get that completion list to 100%, and it's incredibly easy to start one substory and just get distracted by picking up messaging cards or trying to complete restaurant menus. That's the best part of the game though, is that even if you do all of the side content as you're going through the story, you get to experience the main plot and then take a break whenever you feel like you want to switch it up, you can run around, get involved in some scuffles, play some darts, eat some food, fight Majima, spend a few hours screwing around, and then head back to finding Yumi. It's a fantastic dynamic and is just so addicting. Because of this little loop, you feel like you never want to stop playing the game. There's just so much to do that you can constantly switch things up, and it's the antithesis of feeling bored.
Overall, Yakuza Kiwami is a fantastic game, and an incredible remake of the first game. They're both incredible experiences, the first an insanely innovative and interesting project for its time, the second an experience that brings the first into the modern day with the rest of the games, making it more accessible, adding more content, and changing some things for the better, but just a few for the worse. The story is fantastic and somehow brings laughs and tears all at the same time. These characters are some of the most interesting, and this is just the beginning for Kiryu himself. Seeing him go through everything and still fighting to go on and do good is inspiring. Watching Nishiki's downfall can be incredibly sorrowful. It's almost sad to see a man fallen from grace. It's hard to hate him because we know what he's been through, and when we finally see the rivalry break, it feels epic, but it's almost sad. These two shouldn't be fighting, they shouldn't be in this position, neither of them deserve it, but it's what had to happen. The story is pretty complex and can be kind of hard to follow. A lot of the twists arriving out of nowhere, but they're well explained and fleshed out for the most part. I personally think that Yakuza's story would improve over time, and again, this was just the beginning. The combat was pretty fun and was definitely a step up from the PS2 version of the game, but it really has its flaws once you take a fine look at it. It takes a little too long to get into the meat of things, and the Majima Everywhere system makes the dragon style feel useless for most of the game. The beginning few hours feel like we're throwing everything at the wall to make combat try to work. The bosses near the end of the game are borderline infuriating in how poorly they're designed, and it doesn't really feel like it's on us, just the game. There's no style to switch to to make things click for these fights, just styles that can make the fight go slightly shorter. This results in feeling like we have to cheese the fights to be able to win. The side content is pretty fun and engaging, giving you lots of things to do to extend your playtime. It doesn't really hold a candle to any of the later entries though, as they would improve the quality of the side content and the amount of it as well. Even when I'm complaining about the small things, just know that overall, Yakuza and Yakuza Kiwami are fantastic games that deserve to be played. Their stories are here to engage, and their styles are here to impress. It's an incredibly fun time, and I would highly recommend checking either of them out. On release, Yakuza was heavily acclaimed in Japan for its cinematic storytelling and its new gameplay. It was well received in the West, but some criticized its tedious gameplay. The game sold over 300,000 units by 2006 and was definitely considered a success in the eyes of Sega. Off the backs of this great success, the next year, Sega would greenlight a sequel in the series for the same console. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.